Hi, folks. Good morning. How are you? Hi. Hi. Uh, I think we have Ryan already who has joined in. Hi, Ryan. Uh, welcome. Uh, Hi. And uh, again, very good to meet you. Welcome on board. And I think uh, Matt's running a little late, so uh, we'll get started. But um, the, what we were going to do today was um, have the first half of the meeting, at least, you know, 35 minutes or so, uh, Ryan, for you to kind of deep dive into what CoinIO is doing, as well as um, talk about Kubernetes observability and open source um, streaming and graphs, which is a pretty cool area. And then uh, we will deep dive into hopefully Chris Larson and VJ will have joined by then uh, so that we can actually kickstart the um, uh, work group that we are forming and finally got approval. Um, very excited about the standardized query language um, definition. So with that said, again, Ryan, welcome on board. And uh, if you have a uh, presentation, uh, please do share. And um, I think for the others, I'll just share the doc on the, please sign up on it and just sign yourselves in. Ryan, over to you. All right, let me share my screen here. All right. Now, hopefully you can see this okay. Yes, we can right. see it at fine. And if I put the Zoom window up here, I think you can't see the Zoom window, right? So I can still see everybody, um, but you can't see the Zoom window. Right. It's 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 looking fine. I mean, only your presentation shows up. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, my name is Ryan Wright. Uh, nice to meet you all. Um, uh, I want to talk today about observability um, from a particular perspective. Um, and so what I'm what I'm hoping to do is to offer a certain take on observability, what it means, and what it can look like, um, and in particular, uh, a certain tool that uh, that myself and uh, the team I work with have been working on for the last eight years to help aid in this problem about uh, about solving a lot of observability and related challenges. Um, so the name of this talk is uh, Observability: Quine, Quine, and the Scientific Method. Um, Quine is the name of the open source project um, that we've been working on for such a long time now. Uh, and that's what I want to share with you. So uh, I'll take through some slides to kind of talk about the ideas and the concepts and hopefully offer something that's a useful perspective on the observability problem. Uh, and then I'd like to hand it off to Adam Lewinter, um, who's put together an example demonstration using Quine uh, for Kubernetes uh, observability related problems. Awesome. Awesome. Go ahead, Ryan. All right. Um, uh, so without much further ado, uh, let's dive in a little bit further. Um, observability means a lot of things to a lot of people. So just kind of for the record, um, uh, the observability that I'm aiming for is just kind of the straight uh, definition ripped off of Wikipedia. But this is the control theory definition. So it's uh, it's measuring internal states of a system so that you can, or, or excuse me, inferring internal states of a system. Um, by using knowledge of the external outputs. So uh, taking logs or whatever you can hook into to get events about some running system that behaves in some black box kind of a way, some way we don't perfectly understand. Taking those external outputs and understanding them, putting them together so that we can infer the internal states of that system. Um, and what I want to suggest to you is uh, that this problem, the problem of observability, is tied into this long lineage of intellectual tradition, intellectual history, because what the problem of observability really is, is just the scientific method. It's putting together theories that explain the observations that we see around us from the world that we experience. And so in the case of observability, we're trying to look at, say, logs and events and things that come out of a system. These are just like the observations of, that we make of the physical world around us. And then we put those observations together and conjecture a theory, a, a unifying principle that would explain all of those observations and be the description of this unknown thing. In the world of science, we're trying to understand the world around us. 
and often using the language of mathematics to do so. Um, in the world of observability, we're using logs and, and events and data to understand systems, and in particular, uh, theories that can help us understand and explain the internals of their operation. Um, so the reason for making this connection is that if we can tie in the work in a particular domain uh, of technical work um, in observability, if we can tie that into this long historical tradition uh, associated with the scientific method, then we can find all sorts of other useful combinations and intersections and ways of thinking about and solving problems that we can then apply to the world of observability. And in particular, that's what the, the tool Quine that we've developed is focused on. Um, but still from the realm of the scientific method and observability, I wanna suggest that we move forward thinking about it as the goal to organize observations in ways that support the theories we want to test. So with observability problems, we're taking in event data or log data and we could just comb through that. We could have a human read through every single one of those logs forever uh, and try to understand and infer what's going on inside of the systems that we're observing. Um, but it, why not help ourselves a little bit, use these computer tools at our disposal, put those pieces together so that we can actually uh, support more easily the kinds of theories that we want to test about uh, the world that we're trying to represent and the internal state of the system that we want to understand. So I've got basically three statements to, that uh, we'll just kind of revisit and comb throughout this, uh, this talk here. The first is that observability is the problem, the same problem of the scientific method. Second is that we can make our lives easier if we organize observations to support the theories that we want to test. And then third, what I hope will pull things together and put a nice little bow on it, theories are queries. The theories that we have about the scientific world are queries that we go run on the physical world around us in order to test those theories and see if they sufficiently predict what we expect. And when we take log data from systems that we're trying to observe or event data from systems that we're trying to observe, we organize it together in a way we can run queries on that uh, data to understand it better um, and test those theories uh, because those queries are theories. So uh, the history behind this project that we're gonna dive into here in a moment is, uh, is tied either loosely or tightly, depending on which direction you come at it from, to, uh, to a philosopher and logician from the 20th century named Willard Van Orman Quine. Uh, Quine was at Harvard for almost his entire career. Um, he did a lot of very foundational work in formal logic and in epistemology, in the philosophy of science. Uh, his work is very dense and interesting, very packed with, with meaning, um, but tends to be pretty technical. Um, but his work influenced a lot of the systems that we use in the work around us. So uh, Quine is known in compiler circles, maybe for the Quine-McCluskey algorithm, which is used when processing compiled output uh, to reduce Boolean formulas and turn it into executable programs in the most efficient way possible. Um, Quine also coined a couple of the terms that get used in modern programming languages and worlds, um, especially functional programming worlds. Um, things like referential transparency, that was a term that Quine coined. The term functor is another term that, that uh, either Quine or Carnap coined. But he spent his life's work really focused on this question about how you go from sensory input, from stimulus to knowledge of the world, uh, to this science. So science is, on one hand, the process by which we gain knowledge. But in the, on another hand, from another perspective, science is the end result. It's the knowledge that best describes the world around us. And so his life's work was really focused and encapsulated by the title of this book that he wrote, uh, From Stimulus to Science. How do you go from sense impressions uh, into knowledge about the world? Um, and for Quine, uh, the main answer to this, and there's a long explanation for how we get there, um, but the main explanation for this is also summed up in another book that he, he called uh, The Web of Belief. 
So the notion here being that all of these facts that we observe about the world through our sense experience, they get organized into a complex web, today what we'd call a network or a graph, that those beliefs about the world um, that we receive through our sense experience are collected and organized into this big connected graph. And some things are near the center of that graph. They're tied into so many other beliefs and so many other things that we, uh, that we believe about the world. And others are on the periphery, on the edges. The things on the edges, maybe you could give them up pretty easily, but the things tied in real closely to the center are foundational to what we understand of the world around us and how we make sense of it all. So here's the pivot point. What I want to suggest as we move to the world of technology and start talking about uh, observability problems, that it's related by analogy to this problem about the world and how we understand the world around us. We take in sensory input, these are our observations of the world, and we structure it into a, a web. Similarly, what I want to show uh, and suggest to you today is that we can get a whole lot of mileage in the observability problem by taking observations, structuring them into a graph, and then using that graph uh, to run queries and have queries run for us to learn and understand what is happening inside these systems we're trying to observe. So in case somebody's not familiar, here's what a graph might look like. Um, graphs are a way to structure data that are in some sense the universal data model. Um, they're very flexible. They, they're graph databases that let you work with this and store it and use it. Um, and it's essentially circles connected by arrows. Circles represent objects. Uh, you could think of them as nouns in the language. And arrows, especially when arrows have labels on them, they represent a predicate. So uh, we can go a little bit further and say every one of these arrows, uh, when it connects to nouns, to nodes in the graph, gives us a sentence that expresses something about the world. That's what makes it so universal. Anything that you could express in language, you can also represent in a graph. And if you could represent it in a graph, you can then compute on it. So when you compute on it, usually the goal is to take a big graph and filter it down to the relevant subgraph that is a smaller pattern of nodes selected out by a particular query, but where that pattern can then be the answer to an important question that you're trying to solve. So sometimes the subgraph itself is the answer. So if I wanted to ask a question and say which IP addresses are contacted from multiple office locations, this is a subgraph that expresses some nouns relevant to that. There's office locations in light blue, uh, process name in the dark blue, and an IP address in black. I can follow the connections for office addresses, the process is being run there, and the IP addresses they send messages to. And I can answer this question about which IP addresses are contacted from multiple office locations. And I can also use this subgraph to go further and say which processes are involved in that communication. If I have those process names, then I can turn them into the answers that I care about. So sometimes subgraphs are the answer to the question. Sometimes they're the critical facts that then some math or some extra refinement on that subgraph can then lead to the answer that you're trying to get to. So in this case, is there a pattern of brute force attempts for someone trying to guess a high value account password? Well, in my graph, I've got IP addresses of each attempted login. I've got the pink node showing me which account they're trying to log into. And I've got some extra metadata about that account that tells me that belongs to a member of the executive team. And so sometimes if you can select the right subgraph, the answer to your question is just a small little bit of processing or maybe some math over top of that subgraph in order to get to an answer. The main takeaway here is that that subgraph is the knowledge that we're seeking. This is how we put observations together to gain knowledge about what's going on, about these important things that we care about inside an internal system, inside the internals of the system. So putting the subgraph together then is the big question. How do you build a subgraph and fit that into the larger graph for, from data that is usually streaming and coming out of systems like Kubernetes and running very quickly, how do you stitch that together in a way that's useful and can actually keep up? 
Um, and the, uh, the answer is pretty well established in, data, in the data pipeline world, plugging it into a stream of events and then transforming those events so that they get connected to each other. So you might take in one observation about a process named Firefox that's running on a, on a particular system. You might take in another piece of information about a single IP address, 1.2.5.6. And you might put those pieces together to say that there was an event that represents communication from the process to the IP address. Um, well, that's all well and good, but if you've worked in this space at all for the last uh, couple of decades, uh, you might have a, a pretty fair observation that graphs are slow. We can't, they're cool, but you really can't use them in anger to put these pieces together to do fast operations on the kind of log data that we have to consume. So this is where the work that our team has been doing comes into play. Um, because we made an observation about eight years ago when this project started, uh, that it's not really graphs that are slow, graph databases are slow. And if we could separate the work for the graph side of the problem from the work for the database side of the problem, then we could maybe scale this out and bring it to new levels of performance and new levels of utility for solving uh, some important problems like uh, interpreting and building graphs from uh, log data or event data for observability use cases. So the graph puts the pieces together, gives us the relationships, gives us query languages that we can use to do processing on that data. The database side of this stores that and gives us resilience so that we can combine together old data and new data. This has really been the work that the team I've been a part of has been doing for the last eight years. So Quine is the named after the philosopher, Quine, the open source project, uh, is a streaming graph meant to plug in to those kind of event streams, put the pieces together into a big graph in a way that is fast and event driven so that we can trigger computation to run queries over that data once it gets all connected. So this, uh, this project is uh, available at quine.io. Uh, some other links we'll point to in a little bit, um, but you can download it and use it in your projects uh, and, and uh, whatever you'd like to use it for but it's currently being supported by the team at that dot. And we were fortunate enough to have a lot of DARPA support, especially in the early years uh, for, for using this to solve some important problems. So um, without too much further ado, let me answer this question about what is Quine. It plugs into these event streams, builds a graph, monitors that graph so that you can put the pieces together and then can watch that graph and monitor it and stream out all the important results. It's really a, this two-step process. High volume data comes in, and then the graph can combine it and process it into high value data that goes out as answers to questions or actions that get triggered as a result. We'll show an example in just a moment of using the two sides of this, the two steps that are required to use Quine. One is through ingest queries, so data streams in, usually in JSON format or protobuf format or text format. As it streams in, it needs to be fitted into a, a part of the graph. So usually one JSON record can represent a small little subgraph, and we fit that subgraph into the graph using uh, the larger graph using what we call ingest queries. Second is Quine's important innovation in this space is that standing queries are just like a normal database query. It's a query that you can issue and it stays live and active, pushes itself through the graph automatically as the graph changes. And every time there's a new match for the pattern that a standing query is monitoring, it triggers action. It can run uh, other queries. It can package up data, send that out to the next system or alert a user, tell them that we found something important that they need to care about. So to plug Quine in and use it inside of an, uh, an existing infrastructure is Quine connects natively to a number of different streaming data sources. It can uh, consume files, it can consume uh, data out of Kafka or Kinesis. Um, you can publish to it uh, through API calls or move data through web sockets or server sent events. Internally, Quine stores its persistent data in any of several different swappable storage layers. 
so that that graph can be this long lived, durable uh, artifact that can tell you about the history of a system as well as what's happening now and streaming in right now. Then when matches are found, you can publish those out to Kafka, Kinesis, a lot of the same tools, publish them to Slack. You can also take a result and call back into the Quine graph. And that's where this becomes super powerful. So uh, just for the record, we've uh, been working to scale this to huge data volumes. Graphs have typically been limited to a couple hundred, maybe a thousand events per second, maybe a little bit more than that in certain special cases. Um, Quine has already been tested and shown resilient operating in uh, data volumes over a million events per second. This is just a quick little plot uh, and description of some of the testing events that we ran through with some real world use cases recently. Details are at uh, the blog post at that.com. But uh, pulling the plug and killing machines as it's running through and doing processing for finding important patterns uh, in real world use cases. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to uh, pass to Adam to show off what he's built real quick. Um, but I want to leave you with an idea of how you'd actually use Quine um, before we look into the nitty gritty details. So in general, it's just a matter of writing a query in, a, in the Cypher graph query language. Internally, we compile that into uh, abstract syntax trees and instructions that get run on the graph. Um, there's a different assumption behind how Quine works than a typical database. Normally, a database would start empty and get filled with data. In Quine, we start with this design concept that all nodes exist. And as data streams in, the, the goal is really just to figure out what nodes in the graph you're trying to refer to and start using them, connect them together. This is how we make it fast and efficient. And that gives us the foundation for running standing queries. Like we mentioned before, it's a query that is just written in the Cypher graph query language, but expressed as a standing query, it will push itself through the graph. As the graph changes, it'll find patterns. As those patterns eventually match uh, the query that and what we're looking for, the pieces get put together and stream out to the next system. Um, so why don't I pause here for a moment uh, and stop sharing so that I can pass the baton over to Adam. Um, and Adam um, has been uh, is a community member in the Quine community here uh, and has put together an example of using Quine for the sake of understanding uh, what's going on inside of a Kubernetes environment. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. So let me share this real quick. Just real quick to kind of give you an understanding of what the um, architecture of the environment I set up here for the demo. Uh, just real uh, background on me, I've spent the better part of a decade in cybersecurity. So uh, when I was looking around at different graph database technologies and found that Quine is a streaming graph database and more importantly, can handle out of order events for analysis, that's what really made my eyes light up and want to come look at this. So what I did uh, to kind of test out the, the technology was create a Kubernetes cluster that has a shared informer running to give me information about changes to the Kubernetes objects. And also I use FileBeat as a lot audit log exporter so that I can export the uh, Kubernetes API audit logs out of this out of uh, the cluster and start to process those. So my goal here and the purpose of this demo is to look at the RBAC use case. So historically RBAC has been pretty challenging with Kubernetes um, to answer questions such as, where do I have over permission users? What is this user doing? And I wanted to start to explore ways that I could start to solve that using the standing query idea, using this ingest query idea that Quine provides and handling out of order events. So my events go into a Kafka topic or each go into their own Kafka topic, which then Quine is ingesting off of. So when you come into the Quine UI here, the first thing let's look at is what are the permissions that the RBAC has uh, or that RBAC is dictating the different subjects inside the environment have. And so we'll see here that if we start to pull out some of these, we can start to see that, hey, here's the file beat permission as a service account that it has and all these different things here. And when we start to then look at um, which of those are unused or used permissions, what's the state of that? So we can start to map these relationships that yes, you could do inside of a, a say a traditional SQL or NoSQL database, but the joins and the combination of that data to start answering these, these complex relational questions becomes the performance hit. And so what we can do on top of this then, 
now that we have an understanding of what the actual current state of the environment is based on the configurations that we have. Let's, let's layer on top of that then, the all of the events coming from the event uh, idle log. And so we'll see here, this quickly grows the number of nodes and relationships that we have inside the environment. And what we start to see here as this uh, continues to move itself across the screen is that we have all of these events for specific uh, subjects that are we can understand very quickly and process very quickly with Klein to see, okay, here's all the events that we see in the audit log for this subject doing something. I know that they have these sets of permissions. What permissions are therefore used versus which ones are unused? And that starts to allow us to, to help to quickly answer the question, hey, where do I have permissioned users? And what's most exciting about this is I can I was able to put this together with the help of the uh, fine team in one query to be able to handle the streaming of data coming in to be able to say what do I need to do I didn't have to build a ton of architecture and infrastructure and figure out ways to store temporary database you know entries here and then read that off and combine it here Quine gives me the ability because once again it's out of order it doesn't matter if I'm able to understand the information full details about the particular subject in this case let's look at you know the cube scheduler user or if i need to have more detailed information come around later once the events have been processed so that was really interesting to me this opens up a whole new world of being able to do security analysis where you can't guarantee the order in which interesting events will happen from a security perspective but still be able to make sure you don't miss anything and be able to make sure that you're able to handle the stream coming across in an efficient manner without having to do rid ridiculous joins or have a real penalty in storage of data. And so that's what was most interesting for me uh, involved in this client project and what I've been working on here. This is once again, just a snapshot of the uh, more RBAC perspective of what we are doing inside Kubernetes. So I'll pass it back to you, Ryan. Cool, I will take over the screen share uh, once again. So as, as Adam was showing, you can take the events from a shared informer in Kubernetes and start stitching them together behind the scenes, um, and then even go a step further to start monitoring that for, are there permissions represented by, um, uh, by the Kubernetes environment that a user has that they're not taking advantage of? So maybe they're over-provisioned. -pro um, or maybe, they're, uh, maybe they uh, don't have certain permissions that they should. Or maybe there's some other uh, some other structure that we care about that is showed up showing up in the graph as a result of building together this stream of event log data or shared informer data uh, coming out of Kubernetes. But exactly like Adam mentioned, one of the reasons this is so hard to do in other systems is that when you plug it in uh, to an existing system. Uh, you you have to deal with data arriving in order that is different than the ideal way you want to understand it. So out of order data coming in and having to juggle the, the problem of did event one arrive before two, before three, before four, or did they come in some different order, making it, uh, making it a challenge to then hold on to the pieces as you put those together and actually understand it. So the typical approach is to build up caches locally um, queues of unmatched events. So you stream in a few records, you're looking for an ABC combination that represents maybe a misconfigured permission in the environment. Um, but to be able to find that whole thing, you typically have to store your A's somewhere, store your B's, store your C's somewhere so that you can look for the right combination to match them together and find the ABC total combination that signifies bad permissions. So this uh, this gets even harder because you can't just store A's, B's, and C's. Once you combine them, you have to store your A, B combination somewhere and your B, C combination somewhere because the next event in the stream might be that third one that is a part of the complete pattern. So putting all of those pieces together becomes a big challenge. It usually requires either uh, holding these things in RAM which means you're forced into artificial time windows for how much data you can hold on to, just based on how much RAM you have available. And then you have to start expiring data out of RAM and losing results. Or if you wanna match structures across longer periods of time, uh, then you have to set up 
uh, key value stores or some other data infrastructure to durably store it, next thing you know, the architecture of your system is controlled by the pattern that you want to match. And if you find you need to change them and find a new pattern, well, it means you've got to reconfigure your entire architecture, store different sets of data so that you can actually put the pieces together out of order and find what you're looking for. So handling this out of order data problem becomes just a crippling infrastructure and uh, software development task. And that's really what Quine is aimed for. Uh, to simplify this, to turn this into just a simple graph problem um, where data can stream in, we don't have to worry about whether A, B, C, and D arrive in the right order for the pattern that we're looking for. We just stream data in, connect it together into a graph, and then issue a standing query to say Quine should monitor for a certain pattern that indicates misconfigured uh, access controls, or a user who has permissions that they shouldn't, or a system that is uh, behaving badly or isn't configured correctly. So any of those hypotheses about the internals of a system can be expressed as a standing query very efficiently monitored as data is built from the incoming stream. And every time there's a meaningful result to that, we get a real-time streaming notification that can go out to other systems or notify a user in Slack or write to a file, just whatever the, uh, whatever the desired output is. Um, so this is some of the background behind Quine. Um, we're really grateful to the community of users and developers who've uh, who've helped us put this together, folks like Adam. Um, Quine was voted the best open source project of the year last year. Uh, so thank you again to that community and everybody who uh, was involved. Um, I want to encourage anybody who's curious about Quine or thinking that this might help address some observability challenges or some of the observability products that you might be working on, um, go check it out. So quine.io. Um, has a bunch of resources. Uh, this is the open source website where you can see uh, uh, demos of it being run live in a couple different ways. And there's a number of different recipes that are also put together to help embody these examples for different use cases. So one in the cybersecurity space, one for monitoring Ethereum blockchain transactions, um, one for uh, using Quine to calculate uh, successive digits of pi, uh, so there's all sorts of fun things and example use cases uh, all built on the recipe stuff. So that recipe page will show uh, a bunch of different use cases, and all of that is found at quine.io. So I encourage you to check it out um, if you're interested, uh, and if you have any feedback from using it, we'd love to hear from you. So there's some Slack links and some GitHub links and so on. Um, uh, feel free to follow them there, uh, check it out, let us know if you have questions. Our, uh, the developers of Quine are in that Slack channel and uh, always happy to help out. So with that, I'll take a breath and say uh, thanks to everybody for, uh, for sticking around and, and hearing about uh, this project we've been working on for so long. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, I did have a couple of questions at the, at the, I always ask uh, pretty much everyone that comes to present. Um, uh, uh, and then I'll, I'll open the floor to the rest of the folks that might want to ask questions. Uh, and I suppose it's twofold. Uh, you, and you've already covered one around the community engagement and stuff, but um, I, I wonder if you could, uh, uh, I guess part one and part two would be, uh, if someone wants to engage with the project, uh, you know, are there open project meetings? Uh, is it, are, do, you, do you run Slack meetings like IRC style? Like what's the nature of the interaction uh, with the project and its and its community and what's the contribution model you know are you looking for new con contributors are there new areas of growth uh, and and um part two is i wonder if you might just provide a little clarity uh and and articulate the spirit uh of the of the commons clause uh that is part of the mit because it's an mit licensed project uh but there's a commons clause and that, that'll be a common question i'm sure that folks will have so i, yep. I thought you might uh, address the spirit of that and its and its intention um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, for the first part, the uh, the community is still a little bit nascent. So uh, we're not so well organized as you guys as to have uh, common uh, regular meetings and such for uh, for the kind of the, the governance and progression of that uh, from the open source perspective. So we aspire to get there, but it's uh, it's still earlier days for us on that front. 
Um, but as Matt mentioned, so Quine is uh, licensed as um, uh, uh, under the open source uh, MIT license, but also with the Commons clause attached. The reason for that is because like every, uh, every open source project right now is trying to grapple with, um, or every, every project even is trying to grapple with the possibility of some bad actors who have in the past come along and said, that's a nice open source project, we'll sell it for you. Um, uh, and so companies like Amazon have kind of shown themselves to be sometimes bad actors in this case. And I think every open source project has to try to grapple with that problem. Um, so a common approach to that is to release code under uh, different licenses like the BSL, the business source license. And the, uh, the business source license is a proprietary license that says eventually this will become open source. So we considered that as a way to help uh, support the project by having a commercial business around it, but also defend against the Amazon world um, and the kind of the threat of that. But we thought it's not a business source license approach is not open enough. So what we wanted from Quine is to be genuinely open. But in order to support the project, we run a commercial business that builds extensions and extra things on top of Quine. Um, and uh, so we thought, let's, we want this community to be open and run and free to, for people to go use it for whatever purposes they have. So we settled on the combination of MIT plus Commons Clause. MIT is nice and wide open. It's, you know, classic open source license. The Commons Clause adds one restriction saying you cannot sell this. You cannot just take it and sell it unless you make a substantial change to it. So, I mean, so, so, so I understand that you can't sell Quine as a service. That's clear. Uh, I think the common question that most would have um, is, say, I'm a CNCF member uh, company, right, and and I'm using all kinds of open source along with all the rest, most of which is really Apache too, at least in this in this um, ecosystem. Uh, am I free to use this as part of either internal or external? Uh, applications, not something selling it as a service, but as a constituent part of a holistic system, like a streaming pipeline, for example, as part of a data platform internally, like, like, like I, I, that, that is permitted use under, under this? Yes, it is. That That is permitted use. So users are wide open to, uh, to incorporate it into existing projects, to kind of use it as a component, an important part of what you're doing for, for some other reason. Um, you can charge for the thing that you're making, you know, and, and Quine is a part of it. That is a permitted use also. So if you're using Quine as a component of some other system and you're charging for like uh, that product is the other system, that is all permitted use also. So really what's not permitted then is, would it be Quas, Quine as a service? Or yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. So you can't just, you know, stand up and say, I'm going to run Quine and charge for it. That's the that's the one constraint that the Commons Clause adds in our case. Um, where thank that's you for clarifying. For that. um, yeah, th thanks for clarifying. We have a few minutes for questions. I do want to leave time for the Query Standard Working Group. Uh, uh, they've got some stuff to show as well. Uh, but are there any other questions for Ryan? Open floor. Going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, so I guess, uh, thank you very much, Ryan. Um, uh, if you're in, uh, I would encourage folks, if you do have additional questions either now or when we post the later, post the video later, um, um, please uh, put them in our Slack. Uh, and Ryan, I'll send you a link as well. Um, um, uh, Great. Regent and or, um, Thanks, everyone. and Chris, are you guys ready to go? Let's try this. Is this better working? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Okay, fine. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so on the query language group, um, thankfully, we finally got the um, okay from the TOC to proceed. So we got all of the votes for that. Um, so now we're, we open an issue 
under the tag observability uh, PR. Um, uh, creating the work excuse, excuse me, Chris. Uh, sorry for the noise in the background. I, I'm, I'm moving today. Um, could you just uh, briefly give like a TLDR on what the work group is for those who yeah. might not be familiar or who might be watching this for the first time uh, when we post the video? Sure, no problem. So the query working group, uh, query standardization working group is just an effort to evaluate and research all of the different query languages in the observability space currently um, and try to analyze them in a way that we can arrive at an eventual standardized query language across observability products that will be similar to what OTEL has done for the ingestion side. We want a query language that everybody could learn once and transfer amongst products and services um, on the egress side. So this effort in the TAG Observability Working Group is to analyze and research, interview authors, and then come up with recommendations, not implementations yet, just recommendations for a standard query language. And then after that work is completed, we'll turn it over to um, other projects or other working groups who want to carry it on and actually um, implement the languages and the features and whatnot. So what we're looking for is support from everybody to add to a data set of analysis of these languages and do interviews. And then after we've collected a lot of the data, have fun in arguing all of the aspects that a standardized query language should support. So it's definitely a heavy lift, uh, especially at the end, but the first part should be pretty straightforward where we're fetching a lot of data and um, kind of coming together and analyzing and comparing different uh, systems and languages. So um, we're officially given, we're, we're officially given the approval to move forward. So I've created a PR um, against the working group with some example uh, data sets in YAML that we could work off of. Um, and I'd like folks to comment on that. I'll paste it in the channel here. And then also in Slack. Um, so please take a look, offer comments, thoughts, um, anything that you think. Um, we're going to start with uh, meetings, probably I'm guessing in two weeks, we'll probably have a, an official meeting just for the working group and anybody who wants to get involved. Um, we'll be doing uh, emails through the tag observability email list. And then we have a Slack channel that I think we'll rename shortly, but everybody can join there as well. Um, so that's really the big update. The first thing um, that we want to get done is um, fill out interview questions or create a document with interview questions that we're going to pass off to the various designers of the existing query languages, like the folks who created PromQL, the folks at Lightstep who created UQL, and that kind of work. Uh, so we want to get that done and also work on uh, some survey questions to pass out to end users as well uh, about observability use cases, because one component of working group is to look at the various use cases we have, such as alerting or uh, generating dashboards and graphs or automated uh, automation triggers that are common in, in the observability space across all types of telemetry data, including metrics, uh, logs, traces, events, and profiling. And then collect those use cases and use the those use cases to evaluate the languages that we've collected. All right. Vijay, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think uh, that's an accurate uh, uh, summary, and uh, we honestly hope that uh, there's a lot of participation. Uh, please feel free to sign up uh, for anything that you feel that uh, uh, you might have experience either consuming or uh, uh, being a creator of one of these languages so that we can help the cause move forward. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? All right, back to you, Matt. Um, thanks uh, for the update. Uh, so we have 
I think four minutes left before we're technically done at, at 50 minutes uh, past the hour. Um, does anyone have anything else they'd like to talk about today? If not, we can return four minutes to everyone's day. <laughs> uh, one moment. Uh, Ryan, I will follow up. It's CNCF Slack. I wonder if somehow something got mangled. Um, I will follow up with you on, uh, uh, offline, but uh, yeah. CNCF Slack is invite only if I'm not wrong. So someone might have to send them an invite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'll send you a link. It's it's the CNCF Slack. If you go to cncf.io, you can join there as well. I think to get an invite link. I, I think I sent you just a, yeah, that's my bad. But thank you very much, um, Ryan uh, and Chris. And I guess we'll see you uh, at our next meeting. Uh, it'll be the, the first Tuesday uh, of next month. So have a great rest of the month, everyone, and see you online.